The way that the discussion will go is that each speaker will have 10 to 12 minutes to give opening remarks, followed by three to five minutes to respond to one another. After that, the discussion will open up to Q&A, and um, it could also be structured more as like a, a roundtable type discussion if it feels appropriate. So, Mr. Quinn, would you like to go first? Sure. Thank you. Well, since uh, we're talking about the Democratic Party, Party, we should talk about the origins of the modern Democratic Party. And I think you could trace its origins to the year 1933. And the reason that the modern Democratic Party emerged during that year was it came as a response to the Great Depression. That uh, the previous uh, presidential administration of uh, Her Herbert Hoover had done nothing to uh, alleviate the impact of the Great Depression. And therefore, uh, when Franklin Delano Roosevelt uh, was elected as president, uh, the, there were uh, uh, tremendous uh, uh, efforts to really do something to combat the Depression. And that's what uh, happened beginning in, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, beginning in 1933 and beginning, uh, for that matter, in the Democratic Party. Uh, the Democratic Party at that time uh, had four components. It was uh, really a, a, a relatively new uh, uh, party as uh, presently, as then constituted, constituted. Its four components included, one uh, was comprised uh, essentially of trade unionists, especially um, trade union members of the new CIO, the Congress of Industrial Organizations, the first great industrial union in the United States. Uh, and uh, also uh, its component uh, un unions, uh, such as the United Auto Workers, the United Steel Workers, uh, so on and so forth. So that was one component. A second component was various ethnic organizations. At that time, there still existed uh, in the United States uh, organizations of various uh, ethnicities, including uh, Italian, uh, Italians, uh, Polish, Jewish, uh, and uh, Finns for uh, uh, that matter. Uh, many of these were left-wing, uh, many of them uh, were, uh, you know, communist uh, in uh, orientation. So that's what the, um, and that was one component of the, uh, of the, initially of the modern Democratic Party. It also, uh, of its four major components, it also consisted of Southern racists. Uh, that virtually the entire South was Democrat and, uh, and the, um, uh, the leaders of the Democratic Party in the South uh, uh, were uh, primarily uh, uh, white racists uh, at that time. And uh, the, the, um, another component of the Democratic Party was big city political machines. And these uh, predominated in many large American cities at that time, including uh, most notably Kansas City, where the Pendergast machine ran the uh, city. But also in uh, Chicago, uh, in uh, New York, the descendants of Tammany Hall, uh, in Philadelphia, Boston, and, and uh, elsewhere. So it had, uh, it had big, big city uh, machines uh, uh, as well. So Southern uh, <coughs> politicians, uh, trade unionists, ethnic groups, and uh, big city, uh, big city uh, political machines. The left at that time, in 1933, was uh, primarily and essentially the Communist Party. The Communist Party was by far the largest organization on the left. There were other organizations on the left, but they were much smaller. And the Communist Party would eventually grow to include 100,000 members by the end of the 1930s. Uh, the Trotskyists, which were split off from the Communist Party, uh, had about 2,000 members. And then you had the Socialist uh, Party, uh, which was relatively small at that time in comparison to the Communist Party. So that was the, the composition uh, of the uh, left at that time. And <coughs> the period 
of uh, beginning in 1933 and ending all the way up until the uh, end of uh, the Second World War in the United States was referred to as the New Deal because uh, the Democratic Party, which coined the term, would, was uh, involved in making a new deal for the working class in the United States, something that would benefit uh, the working class in the United States. So uh, that was the, uh, the term that they had given to the, poli uh, the, the, the politics and, and policies that uh, they espoused uh, there. And so uh, uh, as part of the New Deal, a whole series of alphabet uh, what were characterized as alphabet agencies were set up. That is, uh, uh, governmental agencies that were known by the first uh, alphabet in their name, such as the CCC, the Civilian Conservation uh, Corps, or the WPA, the Works Progress Administration, or the PWA, the Public Works Administration. There were many of these, too many to even mention in, in my remarks uh, uh, here. But out of these uh, organizations that were set up under the New Deal and the Roosevelt administration, you came some, you, you evolved some of the most important advances for working people in the United States. And the one that you would all know is Social Security. That so, there was no such thing as Social Security before the New Deal, and it was a product of the, the, uh, of the New Deal. Some of the people that were involved in the uh, Roosevelt administration uh, that were championed these news of progressive uh, uh, developments were people like Senator Robert uh, Wagner, Sr. of New York uh, City, and uh, the Secretary uh, of Labor, uh, Frances Perkins, uh, one of the first women to be a, uh, a leading uh, politician uh, in the uh, United States. <clears throat> So that uh, the, 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 they were uh, really uh, essentially the, uh, the components uh, of, of the, uh, the New Deal. Uh, I, I grew up uh, as a member of the Democratic uh, uh, family. My family was a mem members of the Democratic Party in Wisconsin. And that was a very lonely thing because Wisconsin was a rock solid Republican state. It was a state, as you may probably know, of uh, Joseph McCarthy, for example. Uh, and uh, uh, growing up in, in, in school, we would have mock elections in school every year. And uh, uh, the vote in my classroom would always be 30 to 1, 30 for the Republicans and one for the Democrat. And that, that would be me. Uh, and that's, it was a lonely, uh, as I say, uh, endeavor, uh, to, to say the, uh, uh, the, the least. Um, so the, the, that was the origins of the Democratic Party. And, but one should keep in mind that since 1933, the Democratic Party has been drifting further and further to the right to right now, one would use a political uh, term to characterize it, it would probably be characterized as right centrist, that just a little bit to the right of the center of politics in the United States, which is not the way that it started out, of course, during the Depression. And it was the, the nature of the Depression that really formed uh, the origins uh, of, the, uh, of the Democratic uh, uh, Party. Um, and in 1964, uh, a major shift occurred in the United States, largely through the efforts of a political operative by the name of Lee Atwater. You probably never heard of his name. But what he was able to do was because the Democratic Party prior to that time and would continue afterwards for a year or so, was champion civil rights legislation, and this did not sit well with the Southern racist politicians uh, who were in the Democratic Party. So virtually overnight, virtually overnight, that Lee Atwater was able to get most Southern Democrats shifted over to the Republican Party. So that's now why you see a map, it will show uh, the, so the South, the Southern states as red states, uh, because they all shifted almost overnight from the Democratic Party to the Republican Party, largely because of uh, 
of uh, racism. Um, I think my time's probably coming to a close, so I'm going to make a, a, a just a, some con concluding uh, remarks here, if I may. Um, my uh, my uh, support of the Democratic Party probably continued up and until maybe 1965, when the big event that happened uh, and, uh, that really um, ended my support of the Democratic Party was the war in Vietnam, which the Democratic Party initiated uh, the United States' involvement in the war in Vietnam. It was uh, uh, President Lyndon Baines Johnson uh, who do, did that. And once the, the Democratic Party supported the war in Vietnam, that was it for me as far as uh, I was, uh, I was uh, concerned. Um, I think that uh, just moving to the, uh, the present, uh, we were supposed to be talking about that. I think today, as I said, the Democratic Party has moved uh, uh, especially to the, uh, the right. And its, uh, its policies today are questionable at best. And I say mostly, uh, I say this because of uh, their uh, view uh, of, uh, of the situation in Israel and Gaza, that <coughs> despite the fact that Hamas killed some 1,600 people in October in, uh, in uh, Israel, which was a horrendous thing, that since that time, the Israeli government has killed over 33,000 Palestinians, which is an unthinkable number. And the United States has supported Israel during this period, as has the Democratic Party. And that is, uh, in my judgment, un unsupportable. Uh, and I'll just uh, close to say, that has there been any hope in, uh, about the Democratic Party over the last few years? And I would say, yes, there has been. And that was in the form of uh, Senator Bernie Sanders from Vermont. Bernie Sanders, <coughs> excuse me, was a socialist in his youth. He was a member of the Young People's Socialist League at the University of Chicago in the 1950s. And, uh, he continued to really be a socialist, even though he caucused with the, uh, the Democrats. He's listed formally as, a, as an independent. But I think that Bernie Sanders gave a hope that there might be some possibility of being able to work uh, with uh, the, the Democratic Party or people who supported uh, Bernie Sanders within the, uh, the Democratic Party. And I'll, I'll simply end uh, with uh, uh, the coming election, the 2024 20, uh, election. What should people do regarding the Democratic Party? Well, I'll say very simply, it all depends how close it look, it's going to look before the election. If it looks very close, <laughs> excuse me, sorry. If it looks very close, uh, I would urge people to, you know, pull the lever for the Democratic Party. But if it doesn't look close immediately before the election, it, there's no reason anybody should have to vote for the Democratic Party. You can vote for whoever else is on the ballot or uh, uh, vote un uncommitted if that's a possibility, vote for the Green Party, so on and so forth. Uh, uh, there's no reason to support this Democratic Party as it, uh, as it now, uh, now exists. Uh, and, the, and the reason is, is that Trump has fascistic tendencies. He, he is a crypto fascist and his election as president would be a disaster for the United States as we can see uh, from uh, what happened during his previous presidency. So I'll bring my remarks to a close and you know, maybe we can have uh, a discussion of some of these points. Thank you. Uh, Professor D'Amelio? Okay. Um, all right. So, uh, well, let me begin um, on a personal level. Um, I have never engaged actively with electoral politics. 
I haven't campaigned for candidates. I haven't registered voters. I haven't gone, done any door-to-door -door canvassing. Uh, my political activism, if politics is even the right word for this, has always been through movement and community-based organizations and through intellectual work that uh, explores and analyzes social movements that I try to share with an activist world. Uh, so having said that, uh, I'll also add personally that I have also voted in every election since I reached voting age. And in national elections, I have always voted for the Democratic candidate for president, even though none of them uh, with the possible exception of George McGovern in 1972, but uh, none of them came close to espousing a progressive or democratic socialist agenda. And relevant to what Patrick was talking about in, 19, in 2024, uh, I will vote once again uh, for the Democrat Joe Biden, even in the face of this horrific and outrageous war in Gaza and in Palestine. So now what I want to do is offer some historical context for this present time decision that I just mentioned. So for better or worse, and I, admittedly I often think it's for worse, uh, we live in a nation that is deeply grounded in a two-party system. I mean, for a century and a half now, it's basically been Republicans and Democrats, even as those parties have changed a lot over time in what they stood for. Um, there was a short period in the early 20th century when we did have a socialist party uh, that successfully ran candidates in local elections and even ran candidates in national elections as well. Uh, but the party didn't last that long and by the 1920s we were back to the Democrats and the Republicans. And personally, I wish this wasn't the case. I wish we lived in uh, a country with a multi-party system where one had a variety of choices, but there, it, truthfully, historically, there's little to no evidence that that is going to become the case. Uh, the second piece of history I want to mention, and again, this will relate now to some of the things that Patrick had talked about, is that in the last hundred years, there have been only two short periods where significant amounts of progressive legislation were enacted at the national level, 1934 to 1936 and 1964 to 1966. Uh, a couple of examples from the earlier period were uh, the National Labor Relations Act, which finally gave support, legal support to trade unions and led to an explosion, explosive growth in the number of unionized workers in the United States uh, that employers had to bargain with. Uh, and it made a big difference in the earnings of, of many working class people in the US. The second, which Patrick mentioned, was the Social Security Act. And although this may not seem like a big deal, uh, you know, until Social Security, the overwhelming majority of Americans were never able to retire. They literally had to work until they died because they couldn't live without a current income. Uh, the mid-1960s saw a passage of the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act. Uh, neither of them ended racism in the United States, but they opened opportunities for significant Amer numbers of non-white Americans. Uh, this period also saw the creation of Medicare, which profoundly affected the access that working class and middle class seniors had to health care in the later stages of life. Uh, and also a variety of war on poverty programs, which didn't in any sense end poverty in the United States, but actually made a difference in the lives of quite a number of poor people. Now, do these periods of progressive legislation bring us a socialist utopia? No. Uh, but significantly, without question, they did improve the lives of large numbers of the working class majority in the United States. Uh, and the important thing to notice, uh, two things about these, both of these periods, in both of them, there were mass movements of people uh, taking to the streets and organizing people and, you know, outside of the mechanisms of elections. And also in both of these periods, 34 to 36 and 64 to 66, 
The Democrats enjoyed a huge majority in both houses of Congress and occupied the White House as well. And having those two things together coexisting, mass movements and that supermajority of a single party clearly made a big difference in terms of the kind of legislation that was possible. Uh, the last bit of history I want to reference before I draw my conclusions is about the activist uh, Bayard Rustin. Uh, there was a Hollywood movie about him this year. Some of you may have heard of it or seen it. Uh, he's best known as the chief organizer of the 1963 March on Washington. Uh, he, but in addition to that event, he was also one of the most important and accomplished social justice activists in the U.S. in the mid-20th century. Uh, he was a full-time activist who sort of espoused and participated in multiple causes and movements. Uh, he was a pacifist who played a leading role in eventually the successful fight to end atmospheric testing of nuclear weapons. He organized demonstrations on four continents. Uh, he organized against uh, European colonialism in Africa. Uh, he was a key figure in bringing Gandhian active nonviolent resistance into the black freedom struggle in the U.S., strategized Dr. King's emergence as a national leader and his Dr. King's newfound commitment to nonviolence. Uh, Rustin was arrested probably two dozen times or more because of his involvement in protest activities. Uh, and he was very much seen in the 40s, 50s, and first part of the 60s as a radical militant democratic socialist with a commitment to nonviolence as a way of organizing. And the point that I want to make is that in 1965, at the height of the uh, black freedom struggle in the United States and at the point at which the war in Southeast Asia was going to escalate dramatically, Rustin wrote and published a piece called From Protest to Politics. Uh, it was addressed to his fellow activists who, by 1965, were bringing protest to a level in the U.S. not seen since the 1930s. And his central message to that audience was that protest will never be enough. If all we do is march in the streets, engage in sit-ins, occupy buildings, block traffic during rush hour, we will always be outsiders without the power and the authority to make the decisions that shape the policies and create and shape the institutional structures that affect the lives of the majority of working people in the United States. And so I want I want to read just three short quotes from that piece, uh, and then make some, a little bit of commentary on it. Um, militancy, he wrote. Uh, militancy is a matter of posture and volume and not of effect. Second, we need allies, a coalition of progressive forces which becomes the effective political majority in the United States. And then speaking to activists, especially in the black freedom struggle, what began as a protest movement is being challenged to translate itself into a political movement into a conscious bid for political power. So what was the response to Rustin's article and this call for political engagement? Most of his fellow activists saw it as a betrayal. They saw him as selling out to the system that was corrupt, uh, oppressive, and exploitative. Why would we ever want to engage in electoral politics? they responded. And so Rustin suddenly found himself isolated from the radical networks that he had been a part of for two dozen years. And instead, what one sees developing, especially after 1965, uh, and I, I was involved in anti-war activity in the late 60s, a militant anti-war movement that would have nothing to do with the Democratic Party and president that brought us this unjust war, as well as um, a militant black national movement that was often severing its ties with white activists and white organizations. 
And ironically, okay, so think about what Rustin is saying and then what happens in this era of massive protest, progressive protest. Well, those on the left ignored and rejected his call for direct engagement with politics, those on the right ended up pursuing it. And over the next 50 to 60 years, what we've seen is from Nixon to Reagan to Bush to Trump, are conservatives and extreme right wingers embracing a strategy of working through and capturing control of the Democratic Party. So again, and this I'll finish up now, and when I think about the 1968 election and how a portion of militant African-American activists and radical anti-war activists, um, I wasn't old enough to vote yet in 1968, so I can't include myself in this, uh, boycotted the election and refused to vote for the Democrat Hubert Humphrey, who was part of the war-making machine, uh, how this helped Richard Nixon get elected, who then both expanded the war in Southeast Asia and abandoned any progressive domestic legislation. And when I think about that and I look at the world we're living in today, I find myself coming to these conclusions. First of all, yes, movement building, community organizing, and public action that makes dissent visible are important, but not enough. One does need to engage with this two-party political system that we have, and for progressives, the sad reality is, but it's the reality, the only option is the Democratic Party. And two forms of engagement, it seems to me, uh, one longer term and one shorter term are important. Longer term, finding and supporting progressives for elective office. I mean, imagine if there were a significant number of Bernie Sanders and AOCs in elected office in Washington, D.C. Uh, it can make a difference over time. And a large enough progressive caucus in Congress could lead to valuable legislative successes. And then shorter term, <coughs> It's just uh, absolutely essential that we vote in November, even if it means voting for what seems like the lesser of two evils. Um, and that we also need to support get out the vote efforts because even, and I don't know if you're keeping up with the last minute headlines, but you know, uh, Trump has just been convicted on all 34 counts in New York. Uh, but even with that, yay, <laughs> uh, even with that, you know, you could see him having a really credible presidential campaign. And if he were elected and if Congress were to be Republican dominated, it would lead to the most frightening four years and maybe longer uh, politically in in, that I've experienced in my life. Uh, and it could take more than a generation to undo. So as I put it, voting takes an hour of our time. So do it <laughs> and encourage everybody else to as well. Okay. Thank you. And Khalil? <sighs> well, so my peers did a really good job at uh, covering the history. I'll try to cover like, more of like, the modern day. Um, and that, that, that's what I really know uh, about the Democratic Party and what it's like come to be. Um, so since the 80s, like the Reagan era, there's like this post-political era um, where many of the large left-wing movements um, collapsed. Uh, there was a lot of splintering. Uh, COINTELPRO was uh, successful, unfortunately, for what it was um, achieved, like, uh, put together to do um, in that it uh, systematically disassembled uh, large left-wing movements. Um, and the Democratic Party uh, uh, helped uh, do that. And so uh, I'm actually really glad that the name of the forum today is called the Democratic Party and the Left because it, it um, speaks to the fact that the Democratic Party is not the Left. The Left is bigger than just the Democratic Party. Um, I, I liked uh, what they both had to say about uh, why we should uh, vote Democrat. However, um, I think anytime we put our faith in politics into electoral politics, it's always going to be a losing strategy for the left because this country was founded 
on right-wing ideals. Like the founders speak about, they spoke about, um, about liberty and freedom and justice for all when they owned slaves. Um, so in a, in a way, it's kind of like a cruel joke to assert that uh, you're building a free uh, democratic uh, republic society uh, when you're when you're literally uh, legalized, uh, have legalized slavery. Uh, that that being said, there has never really been a time in history where we've been able to achieve reforms, even with electoral uh, strategies, without the component of like mass left wing working class movements, the mass left mass uh, working class movements in the 1930s. Those were largely led by uh, the Communists and the Communist Party. Um, unfortunately, when the Communist Party was at its uh, greatest strength, and I know I said I wouldn't go into history, but I'll <laughs> go into history. Um, unfortunately, when the Communist Party was at its greatest strength, it did pursue a strategy of reform over fighting for revolution. And as a result, um, we did have elected officials who were communists in the 1940s and 50s. And they were later betrayed and arrested by the government that they were um, that they were uh, working for. Um, so to the, to that extent, I would say that it is a mistake for the left. The the right is able to move uh, their candidates further right every single election cycle because right wing politics is not a, is not a threat to property and power, but left wing proper, uh, politics are. When you have any type of movement fighting for a more egalitarian society, it threatens the profits of the capitalist class. And so because of that, even if we, as the left, have a reform movement um, and we achieve that through, let's say, reform measures through electoral politics, it's not, it's not going to be necessarily what we wanted. For example, in uh, the Wall Street, the Occupy Wall Street movement, um, with Obama's election, uh, there was a lot of calls as there are today for a universal health care system, like a lot of our uh, peers in Europe have, like industrialized countries. Um, they have a much more robust welfare state than we do here. Uh, and here's why I have talked about history to talk about the modern day is that the reason why those countries have a robust welfare state is because of communists, like, like very radical, militant, communist and socialist organizing, um, and not just in those countries, but in the countries that were their neighbors, like the Soviet Union, for example. Um, the Soviet Union existed for the time that it did up until about the 60s and 70s, or the 70s, um, as essentially a threat to the ruling classes of the world, because they had a policy of expanding the revolution to other countries. And in order to placate the working classes of these other countries, like in Europe, that were adjacent to the Soviet Union, the ruling classes, the capitalists in those countries had to give some concessions to the workers, to the working class, to make revolution seem less appetizing. And so what was that? That was universal health care. That was um, shorter work days, like they have in like Denmark and Sweden, like they have like four hour work days now over there. Um, that 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 the existence of a working of a worker state like that was um, for better or for worse <laughs> putting pressure on the ruling classes of first world capitalist Western countries to um, essentially make their societies <coughs> more worker friendly. Um, with the collapse of the Soviet Union and uh, the quote unquote end of history. Um, We've seen a resurgence in right-wing politics, especially, um, because there, there is no, e even though the Soviet Union did abandon its mission as being um, the vanguard of the working class, um, the collapse led to an ideological victory of capitalism. And that's put us in like a political dark age in the left, essentially, where the, you know, whether we, like the Soviet Union or not, um, that was at, at a time the most progressive country uh, in the world. And so with its collapse, 
um, brought a, like a, a dramatic splintering. So I say all this to say that we shouldn't un, we shouldn't overestimate how effective electoral means has have been through securing um, reforms, concessions for the working class, because there was always a secondary component to, to that. Like in the 1930s, there was, a, there was mass protest movements. There was a strong working class militancy, um, labor movement, led by the communists in the 60s. Um, it was very much a similar story. Um, and, and now, uh, even today, um, when Obamacare was passed, that was on the backs of the Occupy Wall Street movement. Um, even then, even though that, uh, that act did alleviate a lot of the suffering for millions of people, it still left millions more out of the benefits of having a stable uh, healthcare system. So I, I, I think it's important, especially because I'm uh, here representing Progressive Labor Party, a uh, communist organization, um, it's important for me to say, especially here too, that, that um, revolution isn't going to materialize out of nowhere. I mean, it, it needs revolutionary politics to, 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 to be born out of. And just voting for the lesser of two evils, at the end of the day, is still going to lead to evil. Um, I know Joe Biden can seem enticing, but from, from what I can see, I'm 23 years old. Um, I've, been, I've been told about how we should vote for the lesser of evils my, my whole life. And um, everything that I was told that was going to happen under a second Trump term happened under Biden. Deportations at the borders continued and even increased. Separating the policy of separating children from their families did not go away. Um, we saw this quote unquote migrant crisis just kind of spiral out of control and they just put migrants in um, shelters, basically like they were internment camps. They, had, they put them under incredibly authoritarian um, like living standards where they had to like come back during a, for a curfew. If they didn't, they would, they would be moved out of the shelter. Um, that we, the city of Chicago, which is like a, a quote unquote a, li a liberal uh, sanctuary city, um, had the nerve to call themselves that while having no actual plan as to be a sanctuary for migrants. And though that was, that was a sanctuary for migrants that were, that were coming from countries that were uh, collapsing in on themselves as a result of the United States' foreign policies. And those foreign policies were, were very much enacted under Democrat presidents. So I think, I think it, it is a political weakness of the left if we organize within the Democratic Party because we do need another option, whether that's electoral or as a strategy for um, grassroots organizing outside of electoral politics. We can, we can put pressure on the government at the same time as building community with people because that, that's what enables revolutionary movements to actually grow is having like those, those, those strong um, grassroots networks all across the country and even internationally. Because part of the reason, believe it or not, when the Soviet Union collapsed was because it was a, a national um, entity. Because Karl Marx even, even references in his works about how communism wouldn't be possible in a nation, within national borders. And so it became unsustainable in and of itself because it, it stopped the, the revolution from um, going further. And, and, and that's not to say that there wasn't um, external um, interference like through the United States with the Marshall Plan, with um, Operation Paperclip and uh, a lot of uh, very strong right wing um, feats of oppression uh, after World War II, because uh, socialism was very popular after World War II um, as a means of pre preventing another war from happening. I'm getting a little bit off subject, going back to the Democrat Party, but the, the Democrat Party, um, John F. Kennedy was president when, correct me if I'm wrong, when the United States got involved in Vietnam. That was John F. Kennedy, probably one of our most liberal presidents ever. And he was sending Marines overseas to kill communists. And so I, I think it's, it's to our detriment and to the detriment of the working class at large if we do um, 
rely on electoral politics. And that's not to say that we just shouldn't vote, because I think maybe if there's a referendum that you can vote for, that might be a good idea to show up for that. Um, I'm not even going to say that it, it, that you're a bad person if you vote for Joe Biden, because uh, I voted for him in 2020. Uh, my political line was not as sharp as it is today. Um, but at the same time, it's like, it's like I, I do agree that, like, that Trump is a, is a greater even than Joe Biden. Um, do I think our time would probably be better spent throwing the collective weight of the entire political left in the United States behind a third party candidate, like maybe Gloria Rivera of PSL? Of course, yeah, I, I, I would agree with that. Um, I think if, if we can put our weight and at least get to like that 5% threshold um, that obliges the federal government to then give like federal funding to a political candidate, I think that would be hugely beneficial to the, to the left if we had a socialist that at least got 5% of the vote and um, was obliged to receive federal funding. Um, that, that's, that's how I understand it, you know, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but I, I don't think that voting for Joe Biden and having another four years of uh, a genocide supporter being in office, of a racist uh, deporter, of a, um, of a warmonger, um, steering us, kind of sleepwalking us into World War III, as some political pundits have put it, like, uh, what? We're, we're probably closer to World War III now than we have been since the Cold War. And that, that's, that's not going to be solved with Trump, but it's not going to be solved with Biden either. What is going to solve it is people like us coming together and finding others and organizing, being out in the streets, boycotting, shutting things down, um, doing a general strike, those are, those are all uh, possibilities through grassroots organizing. But and I'm, I'm gonna reference like economic theory here, but like there, when we put our, uh, put our work into uh, electoralism, there's an opportunity cost there. Like the opportunity cost is that the time that you spend pursuing electoral strategies is time that you could have spent pursuing revolutionary strategies. Um, and that's not to say that we shouldn't fight for reforms, we definitely should, but the goal overall needs to be revolution. Thanks. So each speaker is, is free to take two to five minutes to respond to points that other, they find relevant that they might want to um, grapple with of the other speakers, and then we can open it up for a Q&A. Uh, oh, yeah. feel free to... Oh, did it run out? Well, I'm switching because it was like 3% like Okay. Let's just wait a moment then. There's a button on the bottom. Feel free to respond to each other, and then we can move to Q&A afterwards. Well, I'll, I'll take the initiative here, um, mm. <clears throat> if I may. Um, we're, we're Marxists and uh, materialists. That is, we believe that there is a ma material uh, causal uh, factor in whatever happens. And so one would have to look at where do new movements that overturn uh, uh, the situation, where do they come from? And there, there, are, there are very few, and they're far between. And there's usually a, a material condition that impels their development. Um, and I think that that's, uh, that's absent at the moment. We have to, uh, you know, uh, look at uh, the material preconditions uh, for these kinds of, of movements. Uh, in terms of uh, the 1930s, what, what impelled the movement was the Depression itself and the, people's reaction to the Depression. That was a major cataclysmic you know, uh, 
social, economic, and cultural uh, in, in, uh, event. And then in the 60s, of course, it was the war in Vietnam. And the war in Vietnam is what uh, prompted the development of the movement against the war in Vietnam. Since that time, we haven't had anything of that kind of a scale. Uh, and we would have to look and see what are the factors that might lead to uh, a movement uh, on that kind of a, a scale. You know, perhaps, uh, you know, the other speakers may have some uh, ideas. I, I quite agree with our other two speakers that the important thing to do is to try to build independent movements wherever possible. Uh, and that uh, voting is not uh, you know, a, a means to an end uh, that we would uh, uh, like to have. We would like to have masses of people, millions of people in the streets uh, in support of, uh, of uh, radical change. So uh, hopefully that will be coming down the pike before too long. Uh, but. Uh, at the moment, it doesn't look to be, uh, you know, uh, really uh, possible in the near future. Uh, the Bernie Sanders campaign, I think, gave us all a, a modicum of hope that something was going to happen. But, you know, as it turned out, you know, nothing really did. But we got to hope for the best. Well, one thing that's interesting is that one place where we all agree is that uh, that we have to have mass movements for change. That without grassroots organizing, without building sort of community that's prepared to mobilize around a range of issues in whatever ways are necessary, change is not going to happen. Uh, and then where there is disagreement is how you connect that to this political system that we live in. And, you know, it's just, I. You know, I can't help, like, with the historical perspective, I have no reason to believe that in the United States, given our history, that there will be success in organizing a third party that grows large enough to be the party that makes a difference in the system. And I regret that. I mean, I'm not happy about that. But it's, it's, there's just so little reason to believe that that will change. Uh, it is possible that you can build a party that for a short while gets attention and accomplishes a little this and a little that. But, you know, as Bayard Rustin said, no matter how big the movements we build, we will always be the outsiders looking in, trying to influence those other people who make the decisions. And how do we become without totally compromising ourselves. How do we become those other people who are making the decisions, you know, so. Yeah, and, and to that point, I think that's why our strategy can be to build a third party that is um, big enough to like ride with the other two. Like our strategy shouldn't be just building a third party that's going to electorally overtake Democrats or Republicans. The strategy um, more or less needs to be uh, building a new system that is not based on the Democrats and Republicans. Um, and to do that, we have to be involved in like all these like little battles of like reforms. We have to be involved in like anti-war movements. We have to be involved like like the, the, uh, the uh, Palestinian um, uh, ceasefire, like in the ending, like ending the war, like genocide in Gaza, like is, is a very important thing for us to be involved in because that's how we find other like-minded people that are going to join like our mass movement that is not just about <laughs> this single issue, but is about a, a, a wide variety of different issues. And that's why it's so important to have like a mass party. Uh, and that, that's not to say that the party is trying to, that that mass party is trying to um, use electoralism as a strategy, but that the party is an organizing tool to keep people, to, to maintain the momentum in between the natural lows and highs that exist in organizing. Like there's going, there's going to be like decades where practically nothing happens and there's going to be weeks where decades happen. Um, and we need, the, the purpose of having a party 
is that we keep people active, keep people caring about politics in those decades where there's very little activity. And then when we can, that we can mobilize people in those short periods of time where there's a lot of opportunity for growth and uh, change. Um, like the, I mean, and in my lifetime, I've only seen the Occupy Wall Street movement and the 2020 uh, George Floyd uprisings um, being those two, two things and now the Palestinian um, resistance movement that uh, has been a call to action to mobilize like lots and lots of people. Um, and the thing is that <clears throat> while, while those actions are really great, uh, protesting against like that injustice is really great, the, what really matters, what really makes a difference is meeting people who are going to maintain that fervor that they have. Like, because honestly, if we did have the same numbers of people, if we did have the same masses that were out on the streets in 2020 for uh, George Floyd, if, if that was maintained over the, the course of these four years, we would have seen substantial change in this country. And that is without having a third independent party. That's through scaring, for lack of a better term, scaring politicians. Like, like they have to be like afraid. Like it's, it's no different from peasants uh, uprising against the monarchs in the 14 and 1500s. And uh, they, they, were, they, were upri they were having uprisings like about, um, about whether it was like taxation, like uh, laws, or uh, like the uh, other other um, class conflicts between the the rising class of like what would become capitalists, the merchants, and the early industrials, artisans, um, people who would become capitalists after monarchy feudalism collapsed. Um, it, it, it was it was through uprisings that that uh, they they got constitutional monarchies. It wasn't through them voting for it. It was uh, through through, through vi uprisings, sometimes violent ones. Um, and since we're on camera, I'm not saying that uh, <laughs> that we should be violent. But I'm looking for you guys to draw your own conclusions. Um, <laughs> Thanks. So um, we can open up the discussion to Q&A, although if people don't mind, I, I might like to reserve the authority of the moderator to ask one question first, which is that in, in the context of really the whole um, historical moment after Trump's election, um, what seems to have not made itself as present in the discussion um, is the question of the Democratic Socialists of America. That um, on the one hand, you have this, this sequence of movements that recall themselves certain moments in the 20th century, right? Um, Khalil mentions Occupy and the protests over George Floyd and the current protests over the war in, in Gaza. Um, on the other hand, in terms of um, organizing politically, um, the Democratic Socialists of America, which existed for a long time, although of course compositionally it changed sort of in the post-2016 moment with, with the, um, Bernie Sanders as the, the uh, beacon, I guess, for that. Um, what, what might we make of, of the Democratic Socialists of America, either, either in terms of its strategy or the idea for trying to organize in, uh, independent politics? Um, should we read successes or failures out of it? Is it, is it something that we should take up? Is it a dead end? Um, I don't know. I'll leave it a little open-ended. Well, let me respond, at least uh, from my perspective. Uh, I, I think you can't uh, look at one position of the Democratic Socialists of America. There are different currents within the, uh, the Democratic Socialists of America. I'm a member of them, and I've seen them, uh, uh, their membership go up and down. Uh, I was a member of, uh, of uh, the Democratic Socialists of America in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And uh, during the period around uh, Bernie Sanders, it, it grew tremendously. But then a few months later, less than a year later, it collapsed as precipitously as it grew. And uh, that told me that there was not a, uh, 
you know, uh, a material reality uh, extent to sustain uh, the uh, uh, the organization. So it, it, it does the best th that it can. I have a lot of friends who work in DSA and uh, and are, uh, you know, uh, recruiting new people to it, uh, are supporting it, but it's it, it has an approach to the uh, the dimensions that it had, you know, say five years ago. Yeah, and I don't know nothing about the actual functioning of DSA to be able to make a good comment, so I'll, I'll skip on that. I, I mean, I, I also don't know the specifics of DSA um, enough to Way on that, way on that too specifically. But I will say, from from what I do know, um, from some of those prominent members like AOC, um, she ran on a policy of healthcare for all. And in the years since she's been elected to Congress, um, that's pretty much vanished from her vocabulary. It's like she forgot what it was as a policy. So I think um, that speaks to the. Some of the, futi the futility of uh, relying on electoral politics without a mass movement, um, because the, the only way that there's any accountability um, for politicians like NDSA to actually hold up like their uh, what their what their uh, support their, what they claim to support is if there is like a a, a movement that is strong enough to really cause a problem for the government if they don't um, enact a, a, a policy that, that we want. Um, I, don't, I, don't, <clears throat> I don't think that's really a bad thing to have more progressives in government because what, the way I see it is that uh, if we have all reactionaries in government, then the popular discourse is that we need to vote on all these reactionaries. And uh, if we have all progressives in government, then the popular discourse is that well, we need to um, we need to either elect different progressives, or that uh, maybe electoralism isn't all it's cracked up to be. And I'm of the uh, latter um, current that suggests that maybe electoralism um, isn't really a path. Be and it's not because of the individuals; it's because the electoral system in a capitalist society, such like in America, is like the first like in its DNA. Like the first country to have to bake capitalism into its like DNA, um, that it, it it is not meant electorally. Like the, the entire system of like gov of like uh, politics of like political um, electoral electoralism is structured in a way that the masses will not have the power to vote themselves into freedom. That that is that is literally what the founding fathers. Um, but that was what their purpose was. They, they, they even stated that there's documents to suggest that, well, not to suggest, to, to prove that when they were structuring the uh, government that it was so that um, the poor, in their words, could not vote themselves uh, freedom, like uh, uh, everything free. Basically what it, what it was was they said that if, if the poor realized that they can, <coughs> that they can um, <laughs> vote themselves, uh, vote uh, for free things, pretty soon everything will be free. And so they, they couldn't have that, so they had to put um, balances in place to prevent um, society from becoming too democratic. And what we on the left want is more democracy, more democracy than this system can really offer us through electoralism. Um, other questions that people would like to ask? Yeah. Um, this is a question from Mr. Quinn. Um, you said that the material conditions, the preconditions for any type of like progressive or revolutionary politics don't seem to be around right now. Um, and you mentioned that in the 30s, you had the Great Depression as sort of the, the nexus crisis of what the uh, left was sort of responding to. And you had the Vietnam War uh, as the uh, next one. Uh, so my question is, what would pose a adequate crisis or adequate material conditions for revolutionary politics? And uh, maybe a little bit uh, playfully, I'll ask, uh, would the election of Trump pose an adequate crisis for left politics to uh, arise? 
Well, you, you're asking good questions. Uh, as for your uh, your first question, I have no idea. You know, that uh, what would do something. Um, the, there doesn't seem to be anything on the agenda or on the horizon uh, at the moment, but uh, maybe there will be. But I have no idea what it, what it could possibly be. Uh, the election of Trump will, uh, I think, uh, generate a, uh, a significant opposition because once Trump, if Trump is elected, once he gets in power, he will do all kinds of things that will piss people off, uh, you know, to say the least, uh, if you forgive the uh, expletive. Um, and that will be, uh, that will generate opposition and, uh, and uh, a movement against it. You know, whether it be, you know, sufficient, I can't, I can't answer that question. Would the other speakers like to comment on this? Because I feel that there's certainly more to say. I, I would love to. Um, honestly, I, I think Trump's last election did that. I think that's why the BLM movement was as big as it was. There were police murders under Obama that did not get as much attention as it did. And that's why I'm saying, like, um, like whether we have a progressive or a reactionary, progressive, quote unquote, um, or, or reaction, I'll say a liberal. A the liberal. Centrist. <laughs> yeah, the boring, liberal. The boring yeah. centrist. Yeah. yeah, whether we have a boring middle of the road guy like Joe Biden, quote unquote, um, that's what he called himself, um, yeah. or, or a reactionary like Donald Trump, um, there is going to be things that the, that the state, that this government does that is going to piss people off. Like, I mean, Joe Biden's already pissed a lot of people off by supporting the genocide in Gaza. That, that's, that's something that happened to a Democratic president that has pushed, however incremental the needle, uh, discourse towards revolutionary politics. Whether, whether, because it was radicalizing for many people who weren't radicalized um, by other things that Biden has done, other things that Obama did um, while they were in office. Um, the, I, I, I'm, I'm in conversation with people when I was at the encampments, I was talking to people about how they were learning for the first time that the Democrats like, really were not on their side. And th this was an awakening um, uh, time for a lot of people because all, all our lives, we, we were thinking that, like my, at least my generation, we were thinking that the liberals were like the good guys. And um, a, lot of, a lot of us kind of got that um, understanding from, uh, you know, just like seeing the election with Trump and Biden and like Biden saying, well, nothing's gonna fundamentally change. Then he gets in office and nothing does fundamentally change. <laughs> well, this is a bad thing. <laughs> Um, because the status quo under Trump was not a good thing. The status quo under Obama um, that that gave birth, that was, that laid the foundation, the material conditions for Trump being elected um, was not a good thing. Like e even under like a liberal like Obama, like we still had material conditions that were so bad for sections of the working class that it pushed them to believe in fascism because we didn't have a working class movement to um, to pull them away from that, and so. I, th I think um, I think it's very possible that if Trump were to be reelected, that we would see another uh, large movement like Black Lives Matter again. Because the thing is, a lot of people they they don't really start paying attention to politics, um, and at least from what I've seen, I, a lot of people haven't paid attention to politics when they've they believe that they've done all they can. And so when you voted and you, the person that you voted for gets in office, you believe well the political fight is over for the next four years. And maybe those people don't really pay attention to headlines. That's what's happening. A lot of people don't know about Palestine, about what's happening in Palestine. And do I think maybe Biden being in office is partially the reason why? Yes, I do. Because the, 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 the media is biased to suit liberalism and like neoliberal ideologies. Like Saturday Night Live, like they make fun of Trump like all the time, and then they put somebody like Nikki Haley on, like Trump's opposition, and it's like, well, she's not like <laughs> even a liberal, but they're still gonna put her on because the Trump, the mainstream media is biased against Trump, and but well, what is that? What does that do? It's like as bad as Trump is, that all, that the fact that the media, that liberals don't like him, is an opening for the actual left as well, because. That opens up conversations about, well, is Trump really an exceptional 
president in terms of how bad he is? Or is he just more outwardly um, open? Like, is he just more open about his views? And that's what the ruling class doesn't like about him. I mean, I think it's the latter. I think they don't, they don't dislike him because he's racist. They don't, dislike him because, they don't dislike him because he's sexist. They don't dislike him because he supports genocide in Gaza and every other country <laughs> that is like non-white. Um, they, they don't like him because he's an asshole. And he's, like, <laughs> he's comfortable being that in, on TV, in front of people. He's, he's good at whipping up the working masses into a frenzy. And what, what I've seen li after living under a Biden presidency and Trump presidency is that having a kinder um, liberal in office is just having a more effective dictator in power. Biden is the more effective at being and running a capitalist system and using fascist tactics to oppress the working class because he knows how to speak better. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, Could you speak up just a little bit so it catches up? Yeah, thank you, everyone, for your presentations. My question is, my first question is for Khalil. Um, you mentioned that when you were describing Biden and Trump, uh, Biden as a centrist, liberal, progressive, quote unquote, and then you uh, describe Trump as a fascist reactionary. But then you earlier you said um, that everything that we feared would happen under Trump happened under Biden. So my question is, what makes Trump a fascist reactionary and not Biden? Well, I, I will say I was being a little bit coy. That's why I said quote unquote when I said, oh, Biden's a centrist, a liberal, because he is a fascist. Um, he, he is giving money to Israel, which is a fascist country, so they can continue to, to enact fascist policies of apartheid and of genocide in Gaza. That makes him a fascist. Also, he's had protesters arrested. He's sick. Uh, he, he's under, under Joe Biden, we've seen police beat and brutalize people protesters. Um, do I think that there's different flavors of fascism? Yeah, I would agree with that. Mussolini and Hitler weren't exactly the same. Their policies weren't exactly the same. Um, were they still like, terror like terrorists uh, for the working class? Yes. And my point is that well, why, why I was um, being uh, kind of shying away from uh, I call him Biden the fascist is because I, I, I think it's important to understand that whether Biden is a liberal or a fascist, liberals are just as anti-working class as fascists are. Liberals are just as racist as fascists are. It's not a matter of what their policies are specifically. It's a matter of how they enact those policies. Um, so, what would you say about the fact that more? you know, quote-unquote, non-white people are voting for Trump this time around and this time around. Oh, well, I'm glad you asked. Um, so Does in, that in, make him racist? Is he really a racist then? Well, like, the fact that they're, you know, non-white, like, women, they're, like, see something in Trump. Yeah. You know, is um, that just because he's crazy and they're crazy? Like, what, what is that, you know? I'm glad you asked <laughs> because uh, that, that's, a, that's a big thing that we talk about in Personal Party's newspaper challenge is about how we've, we're seeing the rise of like a multicultural fascism. Uh, I, I was talking to some comrades about this and I was like, well, the, the new slogan for fascism might as well be like fascism. We'll let anybody in nowadays. Because <laughs> it's true, like uh, Barack Obama was drone tracking weddings for all the years that he was in office. He was deporting kids, putting them in cages at the border. Those policies that we hated about Trump started under Obama. What, what, I, what I mean to say when I call Trump, when I call Biden a liberal, maybe this is something I, could, I should have better rhetorically, because um, I, I don't, I didn't, ha I feel like I, did, I almost feel like I didn't have to make the distinction between Biden being a liberal and a fascist, or a fascist, because they're so similar. <laughs> the, the, the liberals just have this thin veneer of believing in like respectability and uh, being polite and being cordial and doing things by the book. And the fascists like Trump, well, they're just they're just openly and brazenly break the law. And maybe the other panelists can speak on it too. I didn't mean to put you on the spot. Sorry, no, no, I well, loved it. If I can, if I can 
frame this, I think this is a, a useful or important discussion to have. So what what is the, the I guess, salience of the way that Khalil's putting it in terms of, one, the question of making these, these judgments about the ideological character of the Democratic versus the Republican Party. Um, and additionally, um, I'd like to pose just an, an anecdote about um, Specifically because the New Deal is being raised by Mr. Quinn and D'Amelio, um, that in the initial period where the New Deal was being passed, the prerogative of the Communist Party of the United States um, was uh, to call the New Deal fascists, that that was the way that they had characterized the, the, the politics of the New Deal, and that that position had changed um, when the, the USSR had aligned with the United States. Um, and so that, in, in conjunction with this question of, of characterization, I guess also just raises the question of, um, is, is it about policy? Is it about who is, is implementing it? Is it about the intention? Um, what, what characterizes the language, I guess? Well, I mean, the one thing I, what I would say is, this is not addressing everything, but mm -hmm. what the Republican Party and the Democratic Party, whether it's liberal, centrist, right-wing, extreme right-wing, and fascist have in common, is that they are all capitalist. I mean, that, that is something that unites them. They're not the same, however. I mean, they might be all pro-capitalist, but there is a difference between what fascism does in the world, in, well, well, in the country. I, I'm not going to talk about because US policies worldwide have always been sort of uh, imperialist. Uh, yeah. uh, but there, there, there is a potential difference between what centrists and liberals might do and what an extreme right wing will do. So given what the alternatives are in terms of that small bit of work going to vote, it makes a difference. But given the unpredictability that started off this, kind, you know, it's like, well, what might lead to the next moment of, you know, mass uprising? Given that unpredictability, what we do have to say is that it's in periods like this that one has to keep doing one's community organizing so that the connections between people exist, the organizational basis exists, so that when that moment occurs, there's the possibility of mass action, as opposed to you just sit around despairing and hope that something will happen, but then are you ready when something happens? So. Patrick, do you want to speak on that? No. Uh, yeah. Well, ironically, that uh, what Obama did was deport actual criminal gangs back to El Salvador. Okay. And what they did mm -hmm. when they got back there was prey on the people who are, you know, coming across the border. <laughs> so in that sense, you know, it's it's, it's ironic, but. <laughs> Did, did you want to say something? It's I have another question. Go um, for it, yeah. This goes for uh, John. Um, maybe I, I misheard you, but you said that there needs to be some sort of civil social organizing so that when there appears to be an opportunity, people can do participate in mass action. And earlier you said that you didn't see the possibility of a third party or like a party like an independent party for socialism like possible in the US. And so I, I just wanted to ask you like what the difference between mass action and like a party what like what Well it's it, you know it's like it, how to put this it's like there's given the history there's so little reason to believe that a third party 
will successfully grow into being something large enough to shape the political system and be the decision makers. And that, and it was, you know, that that pushed Bayard Rustin into saying that, oh my God, these movements that we have, yes, they're so wonderful, but do we always want to be the ones yelling outside? And in the absence of historical experience in the US, in the political culture of this country that's so deeply embedded, do we believe that we could create <clears throat> a third party? Now, maybe <laughs> a younger generation has the hope that will allow it to do the work that could actually make that happen. But if I look at historical experience, I just don't see it succeeding. Yeah, that was my question is a, a kind of a response to that. So when you talk about the historical salience of a third party, I think back to the Eugene Debs Socialist mm -hmm. Party of America. Yes. Um, uh, well, one, well, we're not in the same moment as Eugene Debs. We're about a century apart. Uh, but do you see any uh, similarity between the material condition of Eugene Debs and, and now? And um, if so, or if there aren't, uh, what what does Eugene Debs and the Socialist Party of America have to offer for our current moment? Uh, general lessons. Oh, God, that's a good question. I think it would take me hours to figure out an answer. <laughs> this is for all of you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, it's, you know, I mean, the socialist, that, that period of the socialist party came during the period of the most rapid growth of industrial capitalism in the United States in a completely unregulated period of time. So that the, the way in which that was, ex, you know, ex, like nine-year-olds were working in factories, uh, a normal working day would be 14 hours a day, and things like that. It just it 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 created a kind of unifying conditions for at least a subset of the population to come together in support of a new political party that stood for. You know, that was anti-capitalist and you know, well, socialist. And, and then there, you know, there have been moments when it just almost felt, in, in the, like when you talked about uh, BLM and the Black Lives Matter, I mean, it just, th there was that moment for several months, over a year really, where it looked like, oh my God, what might this lead to? And I wish I could, exp I understood why it, it couldn't build beyond itself, but, I don't know what the next moment like that will be. So, and whether it could provoke political organizing, not just demonstrations and protest. I, I'd like to point out that during that period, the Debsian period, that was a period in American history where the class struggle was going on. It was a, the class struggle was between which class was going to rule, the working class or, or the owning class. And that's, uh, I think we know what happened uh, uh, as a result of that, uh, that conflict, that the ruling class did win, and it established a relationship of forces uh, where the, uh, the, the ruling class was on top and the working class was on the bottom. Um, but uh, when, when Debs was still uh, around, that question had not yet been resolved. It was still very much a question, of, it was up in the air. It was a question of uh, who would win. But it was ultimately re re uh, resolved and uh, it has been since that time. And let me just add one thing before. This, you know, one of the, I feel like one of the historical tragedies of the collapse of the Socialist Party is that, and then a handful of years later, you have the Great Depression, which could have been the best possible moment for that socialist party to really expand. But then it just wasn't there. Damn. <laughs> you know. I agree. Um, I, I mean, I think that's why it's so important that we, we do the work of uh, rebuilding the movement because, um, like, like you were saying about like if, if there is like a big enough like movement of young people who believe in like a third party, who believe in a possibility of politics outside the, the, the two-party binary, 
um, that there will be a solution. It's like, uh, as much as we talk about materialism, we have to also look at the other side of materialism, which is ideology, which is like, it's dialectical materialism. It's the ideology that leads to the material world. The material world impacts people's ideology, right? So to that point, um, if enough people do believe in an idea, it can impact the real world. So the important thing is that if you don't believe that it's possible for a world outside of a two-party system, you start believing that it's possible first. Because if you don't believe that it's possible, even if you think that it's, that, that it's uh, a long shot, if you don't believe that it's possible, you're not going to be inspired to act. So the best thing, the most important thing that we can do on the left is to talk to our friends who might agree with us, talk to our family who might agree with us. I mean, don't, don't, <laughs> at this point, I wouldn't say get into a protracted conversation with your Trump supporting uncle <laughs> <laughs> about this stuff, but like maybe talk to people that you know who supported Bernie Sanders and befriend them, take them out to lunch, talk to, like, talk to them, um, and, and, and try, try to thread the needle, get those politics like further left because that's what's gonna it's by, like allow like get them out to uh, or, to organize with you like in the future like uh, getting them to protests, getting them to rallies, getting them to actions, and having that visibility um, is going to be what what makes us like more powerful. Like and and, and don't use the excuse that we're just too small now that the left is too disunited that we're too unorganized because in in Russia before the communists took power there. The Bolshevik party was only about 200 people before they had a revolution. It was, it was through that crisis that was like similar in scope to the Great Depression, except a lot worse because they were going through World War I where the Russian Empire was really getting its ass handed to them um, by the central powers. That, that, that's, that's a large movement that was, that was fighting for peace is what led to a revolution in that place. And same thing in, in China, when the nationalist um, government was just abandoning groups of people um, to the Japanese for them to be terrorized by them. Um, the communists were the ones who were actually winning the, like, the support of the masses, of the workers and peasants. Um, it, was, it was the communists who were waging guerrilla warfare in territories that were already occupied and arming the peasantry and arming the working class in China so that they could, they could defend themselves. Not just trying to, um, to, to guard the civilian population like they were, like they were, like they were property, but they were, they were recruiting them into the army because they were saying, well, the war that we're fighting for includes your leadership too. It includes you too. And we should, we should also be like putting that, um, that belief in, in, the, in, in the, the movement for any of the genocide in Gaza, that we need a, a mass working class communist movement in, in Gaza that is capable of, win, of actually winning the war in a way that Hamas really can't. Because Vietnam won against an a, a enemy that was uh, numerically um, and uh, ec uh, like a, a economically superior and uh, materially superior, pretty much every way. And they were able to win through a mass movement that galvanized the entire population to believe in a society where they would have equity. And whether that came to be or not, the, 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 the fact remains that it's, it's the idea that people coalesce around that moves them into action. I'd like to um, circle back on the question of debt, and the reason is because we also talked briefly about Trump, and if, if we look at political history, or United States political history more broadly, um, we now have two candidates for, for the presidency, two credible candidates for the presidency who have or will run from jail. Um, the other, of course, being Eugene Debs. And so 
what, I, what I'd like to ask is the question of the relationship between political parties and the state that um, Eugene Debs was in jail <coughs> for the Wilson presidency, um, a Democratic presidency, which had jailed him on the basis of the Sedition Act, protesting for, or, or rather against, um, the First World War. And political parties being organizations with uh, built around a common interest or political interest, but that, that shared interest is intended to be applied or necessarily demands state power. Um, when the left relates itself to the Democratic Party, either in the sense of voting for the Democratic Party, having political demands for it, or wanting to organize outside of it, um, is that related to the prospects for the left in the future organizationally? Um, I suppose it's a really broad question, but uh, what I, I want to emphasize, I guess, is this, this question of the idea of the Democratic Party as having the capacity for state power and the left being in a position where that's really not the case. Well, the Democratic Party does have state power. <laughs> you know, that's, that's just the, 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 the way it is. Um, the question was, what is your, the second part of your question? The emphasis is on what what the left ought to consider, given the fact that the, the Democrats have state power. And that might not just be in the context of the, of the demands that we should be making on Democrats, but um, that the Democratic Party jailed Eugene Debs as well. That, that the, the, the left has, has, the left has faced obstacles from institutionalized state power just as much as opportunities. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would, I mean, I would say that, um, this goes, this goes back to kind of like what we talked about like with voting, um, and using electoral politics in conjunction with, um, building grassroots uh, mass movements is that, um, I, I would, I would say that if, if you feel so moved, like um, morally, that you can't let another Trump presidency uh, go, go, um, I would say that's not something that I that you I, I would really advise leftists to incorporate into like our organizing because we want to distance ourselves from the Democrat Party because they did things like jail Eugene Debs because they did things like start the Vietnam War because they did things like. Um, support the Iraq invasion um, and Afghanistan. Um, we should distance ourselves from that because there, believe it or not, there's actually a lot of people that are pretty much apolitical, uh, especially in this country, that are that will identify as liberal or conservative. And you're not going to win those people to left-wing politics by uh, saying how much of a Democrat you are, how much you support Democrat politics, because the truth is that those, those are liberal politics that have left out millions and millions of people to the point where, like, even on our biggest um, uh, voter turnout <laughs> in 2020, that was a historically highest turnout, turnout, right? That was about 160 million people voted. I'm not sure. About 160 million people um, voted. That was about still like two-thirds of voting age population Americans, which means that a third um, still didn't vote, even with the historically a high voter turnout. So the, like, we're doing ourselves a disservice to our own organizing strategies if we just focus on people who identify as like, just liberal or just conservative. Um, and we, we should be criticizing um, Democrats, like, I would say even more than we could have Republicans, especially with the area that we're in, find ourselves in a very, like, state, in a state that's very blue, uh, deep blue, especially in Chicago. Um, we don't need to tell people that we disagree with Republicans. That's kind of like a foregone conclusion almost, which, <laughs> like, most of us um, don't ha have friends already that are not Republicans. Um, so we're, we're not really doing anything by saying how bad Trump and how bad Republicans are. We are making political gains when we talk about our disagreements with Democrats because a lot of people, they hear 
left wing and they think that we're liberals. And our job as communists, as socialists, to whatever other flavor of leftist you consider yourself as, um, should be to make the distinction known that we are not liberals, that we do, that we are not fighting for like just reform movements. We're not fighting for a kinder, nicer capitalism that's more humanistic, that's um, less oppressive to the working class. We're fighting for working class control over the means of production, which means the government, which means the state, which means eventually abolishing borders and states to eliminate the wars that are caused due to borders. That's, that's a whole different world than we're living in now. And it's hard to conceive, but it begins with I just going to protest, being in these encampments, being at rallies, if there's somebody murdered by the police, show up, talk to people about how this is a part of capitalism, how the dehumanization of black people, how the dehumanization of brown people is a crucial um, component of the capitalist mythology that the market um, will just make everything right for people and that if you don't do th that if you end up um, left out by the market it's because you did something wrong when in reality there's factors outside of our control that result in a multitude of different situ uh, situations that result in premature death for the working class and that's no matter what your race is and we need to we need to get people on on that um, that thread that um, we're we're not embracing liberal identity politics. That doesn't do anything for us as a movement. We talked about how the Black Lives Matter movement fell apart. Part of that was because of identity politics. So that was because we had a large trend of black nationalism that was telling black workers and white workers that like, oh, if you're white, you can't really be like this. Isn't your movement? What the hell sense does that make? Ending racism helps us all because they're capitalist. When they can pay a black worker less than a white worker, what does that mean for you when that capitalist goes through hard times economically? He's gonna fire his white worker and then hire two black ones and pay them less than he was paying the other one. That's not that's not beneficial to anybody. And so we need to we need to be coming up with with we need to spread rhetoric that is beneficial to all people, not just saying like, oh, if you're fighting for black rights, if you're fighting for brown rights, if you're fighting for anti, uh, against anti-Asian racism, that you're doing somebody a favor. It's not doing a favor to them. It's, it's showing solidarity, which is helping us all. discontents with uh, capitalism, uh, its, its modes of production were, were severe, um, and therefore, uh, according to you, um, led or uh, started the basis for revolutionary tactics and movements. Um, and uh, now, today, uh, do we see the same, like now that we have, like, you know, in Europe, we have, like, you know, as I said, like, for our work weeks, we have the better welfare state in Europe, and today we're, uh, you know, uh, probably better off, I'm like, I, when I was not, I was working in factories. Um, so like, if the conditions for working are, are probably improved for uh, people, and uh, if that is not a terrible basis for people to realize their, uh, their like, proletarianization, um, like have capitalists just gotten too good at capitalism for people to realize their uh, discontents, or is the crisis, or how should we illuminate the crisis of capitalism for uh, working class people today? And then that also uh, is responding to um, uh, Khalil's uh, uh, topic about Black Lives Matter, uh, the centering of, uh, of race and sex and uh, other social issues as the revolutionary subject, uh, uh, rather, or maybe uh, uh, in conjunction with the working class. Uh, what can we do to, um, what can we do to bring about a movement that uh, would, like create political salience uh, for the revolutionary subject being the working class, uh, maybe instead of, or maybe uh, alongside the ones we have now, which is BLM that have been most salient 
but centering around the uh, subject of um, racism. Uh, so this is probably yeah. I'll I'll append just one one basic question first, maybe, which is 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 the revolution is the revolutionary subject the working class? Because that's that's a question in a, in another <coughs> cycle. Yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, the first thing I would say is like, okay, yeah, this is not the 1980s and 1890s, but actually, I mean, but since the 1960s, the condition of large numbers of working class people have actually declined. I mean, people are struggling, families are struggling in ways that, you know, in the late 50s and early 60s, it started to seem like, oh my God, things are are so good for us now. Uh, and so, yes, there should be, there's potentially a lot of, I don't know how one will do this, but there's potentially a lot of basis for organizing around class issues uh, because, you know, I mean, you know, all the rhetoric about the 1%. And, you know, and it's also, it's hard to believe that, uh, you know, in 1960, the top federal income tax rate was 90% for the, you know, the highest edge of, of, of income. And it, it, like, we're nowhere, it, it's just horrifying to realize how that has been redone. So yes, I mean, there, there, it would seem to me that there's a, a lot of basis for really arguing about economic issues and the structure of wealth and, and things like that. Um, I mean, the, the, the way I would sort of like, you know, kind of re responding to much of what's been said is that, you know, whatever choices need to be made, there needs to be a multi-level multi layer, multi-layering of methods so that you need organizing at the community level, you need mass protests and demonstrations, you need, you know, and, and you need electoral politics. And what form that electoral politics will take, it could take many different forms, but you can't just be on the outside yelling and screaming. So. All right. I would also like to add that um, we shouldn't we should look at uh, looking at class politics as something that's separate from politics of like race and gender because they're very much the same. Like your your the, the gender and the race that you are very much has an impact on your social and polit political life. Um, to the extent that it, it all it has influence over how much money you make. Mm -hmm. And how much money you make has influence over how long you live. Mm -hmm. So you can literally make the argument that um, because of the race and gender that you are, that it literally does kill you faster, mm -hmm. um, which is a class issue, of course. Um, so and to that extent, I'll also say that electoral politics does change based on the mass movement that um, it, it's born out of. So, the, the, but, but to that, the, when I say that, I, I'm saying that the mass movement is still the primary um, political factor there. It's not, it's not the electoralism, it's the mass movement that's influencing the electoral politics, which that can, that can unite people around like a, a certain program, it can unite them around a reform, and maybe that reform will sharpen the class struggle to the point where revolutionary politics becomes like, um, more pushed to the forefront, and that's why I say that we should be in reform struggles as uh, any type of uh, leftist. I, I myself am a communist, as I said earlier, um, and I, I still, as a communist, know that it's important to be involved in reform movements because that's what pushes the discourse towards revolution. Like Bernie Sanders is very much a reformist, but the disappointments, and this is and this is something you can even like read Lenin talking about, is that it's not necessarily conditions getting worse that mobilize people towards revolution. It's oftentimes the disappointment of having their expectations betrayed that leads to people um, developing revolutionary politics, myself included. Um, so I think I think we should we should do everything we can to build a movement that looks as legal as possible. Um, and we should, we should still be ready for um, that, the, that the goals of that movement to not necessarily materialize the way that we want them to. But maybe there's a different goal, hint, hint, wink, wink, that is achieved in doing so. Mr. Crane, do you want to answer? No, that's okay. I, I, 
So I'll, I'll ask one question, and I think this is extending from the, the, for the question just before, and also maybe an opportunity to formulate closing remarks, which is um, there are two sort of pivotal moments that change the, the constituencies of, of the Democratic and Republican parties, which is the Civil War, which integrates um, black people into politics, and the passage of the Civil Rights Act, which solidly shifts black um, constituencies to the Democratic Party. And so what I'd like to ask is that the characteristics, or the, or the, the characteristic of, of political conflict, I guess, between the Democratic and Republican Party, especially in the, the latter half of the second, uh, or the latter half of the 20th century and, and onwards, is a question of, of constituency representation. Uh, who, who is the audience of a particular party, the, the identity, the um, status, class, whatever. And so in the context of movements like Occupy, which are decrying the 1%, BLM, which are raising this, uh, this emphasis on racial disparity, um, if one is interested in left politics or motivated by left politics, how might they differentiate themselves from the sort of intrinsic political dynamics which already have an interest in, ca in capturing or representing within their political party a particular demographic um, over another. What, uh, maybe just to draw a concrete example, right? The, the Democratic Party, um, for better or worse, is the party of black people today. And so in what sense might um, an interest in racial emancipation um, be able to motivate a desire to work or break from the Democratic Party, if that's necessary, because that's that's itself not a presupposition. And feel if 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 anyone wants. Could you to possibly answer. rephrase the question? <laughs> um, what there are movements today that are formulating on the basis of these sort of concrete um, groups. Uh, BLM is an example, but maybe immediately right now is, is this emphasis on the opposition to the war in Gaza. And so the Democratic Party could represent the, you know, either Palestinians or anti-Zionists or so on. What might the left want to do if it's necessary to engage with these movements to say that either it would be necessary to differentiate yourself from the Democratic Party to realize those demands or um, that those demands would be better served by some sort of left politics external to the Democratic Party. Did you guys have anything? Well, well Go you, ahead. you just you have to just point out exactly what the the, the line of the Democratic Party in uh, in Palestine and Gaza is. That you know they they. The, the key question this week was, uh, has a red line been passed? Well, of course it's been passed. But Biden thinks that no, it hasn't been passed. You know, what, what do you need? Do you need another 10,000 uh, Palestinians to be killed before a, a red line is passed? Um, and so you know what the line of Biden and the Democratic Party is in regards to uh, Israel and Palestine. And uh, you should act, act accordingly on that. I, th I am, I am uh, really encouraged by the number of demonstrations all across the uh, country at, on campuses, uh, even at, at Northwestern here, you know, uh, in opposition to uh, the, what, what uh, Israel is doing. Uh, in, in Gaza. So that's, uh, that's quite encouraging. Well, let me use a, a, a kind of historical example to then make a, a larger point. Um, one of the things that Bayard Rustin organized around and worked around in the 1960s, no African American organizations had taken a position on minimum wage laws. And he fought to, hard to get both national and more local black organizations to take on that issue. OK? 
Okay. Uh, the Black Lives Matters movement. The LGBTQ community for generations has had to deal with police violence and police abuse. Mobilize that community in support of the Black Lives Matters movement. So I think we all always need to be looking for ways that these separate issues and these separate movements can find ways to realize, oh my God, we may not be exactly the same thing, but we're really in this together as a way of building. And over time, one would hope that that building of alliances can then also create this kind of large class unity of the majority of people who are faced with the exploitation and of capitalism. I'm sorry, I'm trying to remember what the question is. Um, do, you, do you want me to just repeat? Just really quickly. Um, it's 8.01. Okay, yeah, we'll, we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll wrap up. Wrap right here. Um, what, when political parties, uh, in, in the United States at least, orient themselves around representing particular constituencies, yeah. how, how might the left di di either differentiate oh. themselves when trying to capture those constituencies or say that the Democratic Party would f it fails to represent them? Um, yeah. Should that be the basis of politics at I, all? Yeah. I, I think we should definitely make the distinction between like, liberal identity politics and um, Marxist intersectionality. We should make the difference between liberal feminism and Marxist feminism, where we're talking about how um, the, the patriarchy was the very first like part of class society. The very first classes that were ever invented were um, men um, violently securing themselves as uh, like the, the patriarchs uh, and like the family unit. And um, I think that's like a, a more, um, that, that, that's a, a position that wins people to a position of solidarity over allyship, which um, allows you to build like stronger bonds with people like in these, in these uh, communities that we find ourselves in. Um, but I, I, I never really felt the same way uh, organizing people in the Black Lives Matter movement, like organizing with people of different races until I became a Marxist, until I started to see that these people, they're not helping me, right? they're not helping uh, like the Black Lives Matter movement because it's a charity, but because it's beneficial to all people because regardless of what our race or gender is or our sexuality, we're all workers. All of our livelihoods are dependent on, our, our being, on being, um, our, we're, we're all working class and working class is means that our existence depends on our wages, whether we're, whether we're unemployed, whether we're a student, whether we're homeless, our existence depends on wages. And therefore, we all have a common interest in ultimately getting rid of the system of wages and creating a society that's egalitarian, that's equitable, um, where your basic needs, where you can live a dignified life regardless of um, the work that you do, because all of our work is valuable, and that's what we're fighting for. Join PLP. On that note, why don't we wrap it up? Give a round of applause to all of our speakers.